Well, this morning we are going to talk about a, a discipline of confession. But in order to do that, we want to give people something to confess about. So we are actually going to have a little game um, to represent the way we bruise and hit each other with our words and with our conversation. So I have asked four volunteers to come up, pre-selected. Uh, Rich, come on up, and Pete, and, and Greg, and uh, Mitch. Uh, come on up, and I'll explain the rules to the game. Uh, stand in this uh, square here, a rectangle, because we want to make sure nobody gets hurt um, or falls off the stage. We're going to hand each one of you a blindfold. You don't have to put that on quite yet, just in a second. And then I'm going to give each of you a newspaper. So you're going to have one minute to see how many hits that you can get. Oh, here, I'll, I'll hit Pete, too. So okay. Here's one for you, one for you, one for you, one for you. Now, behind us, uh, Kenny is going to be keeping track of uh, this side, how many hits they're getting, so how many times they're able to, to successfully get a hit. And then, Albert, you're going to keep track of these two. All right? So, well, not really, I wouldn't call it a team. I just say he's going to keep track of both of you. So, no, there's, yeah, you definitely is no team. There's definitely no team. So you're going to have one minute, and then at the end, we're going to model how you confess to one another when you've done something wrong. All right? Everybody put your blindfolds on. Let's make sure there's no peeking. This isn't like heads up, seven up, no looking at shoes or anything. Okay. All right, ready? I'm going to count down from 12, and then as soon as you hear me say zero, the music will start. You have one minute to get as many counts as possible. Ready? 12, 11, 10. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Come on, Mitch, you're doing well. Okay. Uh, oh, oh, they got they got rich really good. Come on, Pete, you can do it, Pete. All right, and the, oh, oh, nice one, nice. Okay, okay, you step outside. Be careful there. Okay, come on, Mitch, another one, another one. Come on, we're getting close. All right, we have 45 seconds left. Oh, I think you're stepping out of the box a bit. Come on back in the box. All right. Are you keeping track? Oh, how are they doing, Kenny? All right, we got about 40 seconds left. All right, how many hits you got? Okay, we're definitely Pete's in the lead right now. You still got a chance. Pete's in the lead. You got a few more. Behind you, Mitch, behind you. All right, we got about uh, 30 seconds left. Who can get the most hits in? We got about 20 seconds. We're still going. Yeah, that was the band you hit, Tim. Mitch. Well, now you've got a few in there. He's over here. Look, uh, walk toward my voice. That's him. Walk toward my voice. There we go. All right, uh, so, well, no, that's me. That's me. Okay, turn back right behind you. Yeah, yeah, let me help you. Let me help you. Back up, back up. Here, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. All right, back in the square. All right, here we go. You got ten seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, and one. All right, sticks up. I right, take your blindfolds off. All right. Well done, everyone. Well done. All right, now we're going to confess some things a little bit later. But let's start off with how many hits did uh, did Pete successfully get? 122. Well done. How many did uh, Rich get? 86. 86. All right. How many did Greg get? Greg got uh, 110. 110. Wow. How many did Mitch get? 13. 13. Oh, <laughs> All right. 13. All right. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have we're gonna have the four of you come sit down here. They're, they're gonna confess some things. Uh, actually, Albert might need to confess some things in a minute. So go ahead and grab a seat. We're gonna talk about confession. <laughs> So we have this tendency to hurt each other with our words and our actions. And <laughs> what we're going to discover is that most of us have never had modeled for us or taught to us how to confess. And our instinct when we do something wrong is rarely to confess it or to even know how to confess it in a way that brings healing to our relationships. In fact, we have a cue. The cue when we go through conflict, when we get criticized, when we feel annoyed, is that cue triggers a routine for us. For you, when you feel criticized by someone, annoyed, inconvenienced, caught, or fearful, what's your first instinct? It's probably not to own up and confess. For me, it's to blame. Well, you're not so hot yourself. It's for me to rationalize. It's for me to excuse. Here's some different routines that come up. Perhaps when you're criticized, your instinct is to get defensive. Right? Well, well you're not so hot yourself. When you get annoyed, maybe your tendency is not to go, wow, what I do? It's, I'm angry that you annoyed me. You're inconvenienced, you get critical that somebody inconvenienced you. You're caught because you did do something wrong. You avoid it. But we're not going to talk about it. Maybe if a few days go by, a few months go by, a few decades go by, we won't have to deal with it. I'm fearful. You begin to panic. That's your instinct. You're panic. You're not going to try and resolve and figure out you're going to panic. I'm stressed all the time. All right. There is a reward that comes from these bad behaviors. We wouldn't do them if there wasn't a reward. So what's the reward for that? There's lots of them. If you get defensive... It confirms your reality, right? I don't do anything wrong. Somebody brings up something I do wrong, I get defensive. No, I didn't. 
See, I didn't. It confirms the reality that you're not the kind of person who does anything wrong. So that reward continues to validate your routine of being defensive, even though it's actually destroying your relationships. Others of us have the reward of feeling justified. We get angry, we get loud, we get mad, I feel justified here. We get the adrenaline rush of knowing how angry we are. And that's why we keep doing it. It's not helping our marriages, it's not helping our companies, it's not helping our relationship with our kids, but there is a reward. The adrenaline rush of being critical. When you avoid something, two things that it helps you with. One, you avoid dealing with it. You escape from it. But for many, they did a study on those who grew up with uh, households with depression. They found that people who grew up with depression or households of depression struggle with confessing. Because when you say you've done something wrong, it makes you feel more shame. And you don't see confession as a pathway to freedom. You see it as a pathway into shame. So you avoid confession because you don't want to feel more shame. That's why the message of the Bible is not about guilt and shame. It's about freedom. And confession becomes a doorway to that. Then the last one we see is many of us panic because it protects us from failure. I'm going to panic because if I panic, then I have an excuse to not try or not. I'm not really good at this. I'm just I'm scared of failing. So I'd rather just not do anything than to fail again. I had a conversation with one of our relatives recently and my daughter, who's 17, was watching me. And I was just listening to my to my friend and our family. And as we were talking, we got done and my daughter turned to me and said, Dad, no matter what you said, no matter how you said it, this person always ended up being a victim of their circumstances. The, the reality was they could never change. It was never their fault. There's nothing they could do about it. No matter how many ideas you gave, there was always an excuse why they couldn't do anything. I said, yeah, unfortunately, that's all of us have this in us. We've we got to open our eyes to that reality. There's uh, many times I've had to confess. In fact, when I first came to our church 13 years ago, I'd really been bruised at my previous church. And I was constantly telling the story about how poorly I was treated, how unfair it was. And John Kirby, our Connections pastor, pulled me aside one day and said, Chad, you got to stop telling that story. I love that story. <laughs> that story makes me feel powerful when I tell it. It makes me feel powerful that I was so wrong. It makes you feel good for me. I get attention. There's all kinds of benefits. And I realized I need to stop telling the story. And it was that conversation that, for me, I decided to confess some things to God and decide I'm not going to let that story control my life. So today we're going to talk about a door. Confession is the door. It opens the door to restoring and restarting relationships. And so God put this in place as a practice. It's not something you learn about theoretically. It's something you practice. They're called spiritual disciplines or spiritual practices because you practice them. So it's going to be a little bit different today because we're going to practice these skills. We're going to practice them together, hopefully in a fun way, as you've seen already. Because confession has been so poorly modeled, it's been so horribly taught, and it's so rarely implemented that we don't have access to the very tool that teaches our kids how to be responsible and have great relationships. It's the tool that will break down division and gossip in your, in your organization. It's the tool that can heal a hurting marriage. It can restore and build up a good marriage and make it great. And yet most of us don't know how to do it. So we're going to practice it together. We're going to practice a three, a four, and then I'll mention at the end a five-step apology. We've taken our whole staff through this. All of our staff is committed that when we bruise each other, hurt each other, we do all five steps of the confession we're going to work on today. Step one is I did it. I did it. When you confess, you need to admit you did it. That's taking responsibility. Now, let me tell you what's not responsibility. That's not what I said. That's not what I meant. You misunderstood too. You're being too sensitive. I did it says I'm taking responsibility. Now, many of us aren't able to do that because of our family system we grew up under. We have a core belief to something like this. I'm not the kind of person who would do that. But you did. No, I didn't. Our self-righteousness doesn't allow us to be honest when we fall and do something wrong. We've got a belief about ourselves that's not true. The second one is, I was justified in doing that and I feel superior. Well, sure, I did that, but it's because you did this. And in one sense, as adults, we haven't really made it that much farther than the kindergarten sandbox. We've just added new vocabulary words to it, some four-letter words to it. But what we have done is when we converse, we have a tendency to feel justified instead of confessing. Thirdly, defending myself protects me from shame and ammo. We don't say I did it because I don't want the shame if I have a tendency toward melancholy and depression 
Or maybe you grew up in a family like a friend of mine did, whose parents said something like this. Here's a quote. We have never resolved anything in 40 years of marriage. Ah, man, it just whew, fills the soul, doesn't it? And in this household, if you did say I did it, the person received that confession as a, as a, a bullet, an ammo that they put into their gun and they shot you with it for the next five decades. You remember that time five years ago when you told me? And you're like, I'm not confessing anymore, right? Because you're not going to hand ammo to somebody. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, Mitch, why don't you come over here on this side of the door? And uh, Pete, we'll start with you here. Greg, I'll let you go second. All right, so we're gonna, we got this conflict that's occurred that these two guys have, uh, you know, hit each other. They've done some bad things. And so, uh, we're gonna start, we're gonna open the door through confession. And I want you to, now here's how you confess. You, you actually look at the person in the eyes. You, you don't confess by looking the other way. Look at Mitch and say, I did it. Mistakes were made. And okay, now that is not a confession. All right. Sorry you felt that way. Uh, all right, try again. Mitch, I did it. I did it. Now, that's the first stage. Now, that is not going to be a great confession, but it's the first stage. And here's why. We hurt people specifically, and then we try and apologize generically. We hurt somebody with a word, a comment, and then we try and say, well, sorry if, if I did anything. And we wonder why that doesn't work. So, Pete, we're going to get specific. Mitch might need to know something. So tell me what, define it for us, will you? Yeah. I did it. What is the it that you did? I beat you like a rented mule. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, and, and there might be more confession to make. Was there any cheating involved in the game? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. He's about to confess now. I'm sorry. I didn't wear my blindfold. Somebody oh. took his blindfold off. <laughs> 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 All right. Grab a seat. You can go beat him a couple times. You can go beat him a couple times. Yes. He, t- he took his blindfold off. Can you believe that? I'm not <laughs> I did it. Now, I'm going to put up on the screen a, a, a phrase. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll talk about this first. So First John, it says, if we say we have no sin, if we say we don't do anything wrong, we deceive ourselves. You are not fooling anybody. Maybe yourself. Everyone knows we all make mistakes. Everyone knows we all do wrong things. So we need to confess. That's how we restore and restart relationships. But if we confess our wrongdoing, our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us those sins and to cleanse us from all. Look at that. If you confess what you do know, he cleanses you from all unrighteousness, even the stuff you're not fully aware of. All right, here's our first practice. I did it. Real simple. Turn to somebody next to you, whether you know him or not. We're just going to keep this real superficial. We're just practicing because it's a practice. And just say, I did it. All right, now turn back to them and say, I did it. I did it. All right, now I'm going to put on the screen behind me some specifics. Now, again, it'll be easier to do this in practice if you've learned to do it with a a lighter atmosphere. So here are some things that we do wrong. I was insensitive. I was angry. I was unkind. I was unloving. I was divisive. I was unsupportive. I was disrespectful, rude. Pick one. I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, I did it. I was critical. All right, go ahead. All right, now flip. Do it the opposite way. I did it. I was. All right. We're going to practice all these steps together. What we want to do is we want to get faster at having our instinct. We're all going to be defensive, have these bad mechanisms. We want to get faster at getting the instinct of owning what we do wrong. I remember I was in Target years ago. And I don't visit this particular Target, but as I was going uh, through the, the line at Target, uh, the lady in front of me was buying some lacy underwear, which is always a cue for me. Uh, not necessarily a good cue, but it's a cue. And so I see the lacy underwear. I see her from the back. She's a good-looking woman. I'm immediately about to start putting the two together in my mind. And I stop myself. Whew. It doesn't always happen that fast, but I stop myself. And I stop myself, and here's what I did before God. God, I did it. I'm lusting after this woman. It's wrong. I'm sorry. And to keep those thoughts. And the reward is, I want to keep my mind pure for my wife. I want to not you know, create addictions in my mind. I don't want to give uh, lustful thoughts that kind of freedom. So that's what's going on in my head. God, I did it. I'm sorry. That's wrong. Okay. Look away. You know? So as I do that in my head, she turns to look at me and says, Oh, hey, Pastor. Oh, no. 
It's one of my friend's wives. Oh, no. Oh, no. I was so glad I had learned the cue of confessing before it got farther. And many of us have not learned that cue. We don't confess quickly. We sort of let it go for a while. We fester in relationships. We fester in our mind. we got to learn to confess quicker and call it what it is. That's where freedom comes. That's where freedom from addiction comes. That's where freedom in a relationship comes. So step two is I was wrong. So it's I did it and I was wrong. In 1 John chapter 1.10, it says this. If we say that we have not sinned, if we say we haven't done anything wrong... We make God a liar because he says we're constantly doing things wrong. And his word, the truth, is not in us. So we've got to get away from this lie that says, well, I'd never do anything wrong. Say, presume you've done something wrong. That's what the message of the Bible does. It says, humility. You probably did something wrong here. I like to think of every conflict like a trivial pursuit board or piece. It's easy to see all the pieces other people did wrong, Right? So you don't take ownership for your orange piece where you were wrong because you're so talking about what they did in the yellow and the blue and the green piece. When you say you're wrong, it doesn't mean you're 100% wrong, but take 100% responsibility for whatever 10 or 20% you are wrong. So you say, I was wrong when I was disrespectful in that conversation. You still may disagree on the point you're talking about. Hey, I was wrong in bringing a critical attitude to the environment. I was wrong. You take ownership for the part that you did do wrong. Okay, so let's model that. Uh, Greg, come on up. Uh, Mitch, are you still in relationship? Hey, there's a lot of confessing needs to happen here to restore these relationships. All right. All right, there's definitely a pattern. All right, Greg, so this time you're going to add in our practice, I, was, uh, I did it and I was wrong when I, and you can tell them what you did wrong. I did it and I was wrong when I took my blindfold off and cheated and hit you. <laughs> yeah. And I watched... And didn't stop him or tell you. And I was wrong for doing that, too. All right. So we give them a hand. Thank you, guys. You got a seat. Okay. So turn, turn to someone next to you. And I want you to same thing. Pick the same list if you want. I did it. I was wrong when I was. And say whatever the one is. So turn to somebody and do that real quick. Then go ahead and reciprocate. Okay, step three. I did it. I was wrong. Step three, I am sorry. In the book of Corinthians, is a powerful verse, one of my favorite, in fact. It says, now I rejoice that you were made sorry. Now, how is that possible that you can rejoice that you're made sorry? Because the Bible offers something that's not blanket of guilt. It's not shame. It's freedom. When we're made sorry and get relationships restarted, it brings freedom and there's joy in that. I rejoice that you were made sorry, that your sorrow, being made sorry, led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. In other words, there's a way to feel sorry that is godly, and then there's one that's not godly. There's a way to feel sorry that restores losses in a relationship and brings joy. So a few key words here. Sorrow, I did it and I realized it caused you pain. Part of the I'm sorry, sometimes we rush through this. I'm sorry for whatever I did. And you wonder why the person doesn't seem to stick. Part of empathy and feeling sorry in a godly manner is you're trying to listen. You're trying to teach your kids to listen. How did what I do make them feel? What damage did it cause? You're assessing the damages of your action so you can feel sorry. Oh, I did that. My self-centeredness did that. My lust did that. My critical spirit did that. There's an empathy proportion. So don't rush through this step. Sometimes this becomes a discussion. Now tell me, how did you feel when I said that? Man, I didn't mean that. I'm sorry. I... I'm sorry I was insensitive, but I I didn't even mean to communicate that. I can see how that might have. These are phrases you can use. Now, he goes on in this passage in the next verse and says this. Actually, actually stay there, stay there. Uh, So repentance means I need to act differently so I don't keep causing you pain. When you really see the pain you cause, you go, wow, I want to not do that again. It's that empathy and godly sorrow that allows you next time when you get to that, go, oh, wow, I don't want to do that again. And reconciliation is I want to restore our relationship and restore the losses that you might suffer 
from us in nothing. All right, next slide. The next part of the verse, he says this. Godly sorrow, empathetic sorrow, seeing the damages in my action sorrow, produces repentance, changes in a relationship, leading to salvation, which means deliverance. It can deliver you from guilt. It delivers you from shame. It delivers you from years of bad patterns. It's deliverance, not to be regretted. You won't regret this, he says. But there's a bad sorrow. The sorrow of the world leads to death. And many of us, we can smell the death around our family. We go to a family reunion, you can do this. Death everywhere at the family reunion. People have not forgiven for years. They're holding grudges. They are mad. They're ticked off. I'm never going to forgive you. Or maybe you grew up in a religious family. You can smell death a whole new way. It smells like a blanket of guilt. Because no matter what you do, the blanket never ends. There's no way out of the blanket. I'm a bad person all the time. And this is just another confirmation of what a bad, shameful person I am. The message of the Bible is that God, when you ask him for forgiveness, he forgives you past, present, and future. And when you do something wrong, you say, I probably did something wrong. God's forgiven me a lot worse than this. And I want to own it. I want to ask for forgiveness. I want to restore relationships the way he restored it with me. And I say, God, thank you. I've discovered something else that you already forgave me for. It doesn't produce a blanket of guilt. And if you grew up under a blanket of guilt, you have not yet experienced the real message of the Bible. It's a great verse in Romans 8.1 that says, There is now, therefore, no condemnation. No blanket of guilt, no shame for those who are in Christ Jesus, who are walking out this. So that's our step. I was wrong. I did it. I was wrong. I am sorry. So we're going to practice this one. So this time uh, we'll bring uh, Rich. You haven't been up yet. Rich, you come on up. And Mitch, the good news is I'm not making you talk. In fact, I got good news for you. I got a reward for you putting up all this. All right. I know. Can you believe that? All right. So here's what you say. I did it. I was wrong. I'm sorry that I was. And then you can mention whatever you might have done. Mitch, I did it. I was wrong to remove my blindfold. (laughs) Me too. Yes. (laughs) And I'm sorry that I hurt you. All right. Now, now we'll get to the next question. He'll say, will you forgive me? And you're going to have to decide that. So that's going to be that's going to be our next step. But I did want to give you a Starbucks card and thank you for putting up with this. Is this, from Rich or is this, from this is from me because I told them to do this to you. And I want you to know I'm sorry. I did it. And uh, I won't get to the next step. I'll eventually. What we're going to talk about. Uh, it takes time sometimes. So grab a seat and we're going to do this. So, so turn to somebody next to you. And I want you to do it. I did it. I was wrong. I'm sorry that I was. All right. We'll give you a minute to do it one way, and then we'll flip again. Go ahead. All right, 10 more seconds. Now, most of us have never modeled this. We've never seen this done. But I'm telling you, here's what happens. If you start... I didn't give you 10 seconds, did I? Should have. If you start to practice this, something powerful will happen, even if you're not good at it. If you start doing it, that's the goal. I'm telling you, this bleeds into kids and, and, and grandkids. Generational changes occur if you can do this. We, uh, we brought our staff through this, so this is a, a process that we're committed to. And we had somebody in our staff said that their, uh, their mom had called up and had a, a conflict at work. And said, what should I do? Got this big conflict, there's gossip, there's division, there's misunderstanding. And she said, five-step apology. Actually, seven, but I'm not giving you all seven. Five-step apology, I want you to, here's the five steps. Sit this person down, say, listen, this part, I did it. I was wrong. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Will you mention this again? If I do it, hold me accountable. And is there anything else? Really? So this person went to work, they went through these steps, and all this division, all this conflict, and and the woman she's talking to just began to cry, like, oh my goodness, and there was healing there. I had another business friend of mine, big big powwow, the leaders are getting together from all the country, and they're going to start off with this real (laughs) harsh meeting, and he said, before we begin, can I say something? I just want to say, there's a few parts of this I, I know I've done, and I'm sorry, and I was wrong. Will you guys forgive me? 
the jaws drop. Like, who does that? And if you're a follower of Christ, you want to know how to influence your friends? Live out this kind of humility. If you're not a follower of Christ, if you're unconvinced, you know why you're not unconvinced? One reason is you've seen such self-righteous Christians who pretend they're something they're not. There's something powerful about grace. Powerful. It changes lives. It changes companies. I even had a guy came in my office recently and said, hey, I'm having a, another relationship with this woman who's not my wife. What should I do? I think it's God's will. I'm like, it's not God's will. I was like, you deceive yourself. Like First John says, I said, I want you to sit down with this person and I want you to go through a five-step apology. What we're doing is wrong. I did it. I am sorry. Will you forgive me? And then let's get off this path. And to his credit, he did it and came back and they're moving in a healthy direction. This is powerful stuff and taking ownership for what we do wrong. Our last step. Last step. Will you forgive me? And sometimes it's helpful to add this part. If not now, when you can. Because sometimes it's going to take some processing. You know what? I'm getting close. My wife and I did this um, this last summer after going through a real difficult time with depression where we'd hurt and bruised each other. I said, I just need one more sort of confession to sort of help me get the final piece of healing and vice versa. We sat down and we confessed stuff to each other. We dug a little bit deeper. And it brought just some more healing into our relationship. Because we said it's going to be us against the depression, not the depression putting us against each other. And it brought healing. And I remember writing out the apology. I really wanted this to go deep so I could find more freedom. So will you forgive me? And if not now, when you can. And that's what I was joking about with Mitch there. So sometimes it might take you a while. I can't believe I got deceived by my pastor for crying out loud. What a jerk. I had no idea. How am I going to trust anyone now? And notice what he says in Corinthians. For observe this very thing. You sorrowed. You were made sorry in a godly manner. What diligence? You got to work at this. It produces diligence in you. I want to keep restored, clean hearts and relationships. What clearing of yourself, what indignation, what fear, fear of God, with dominant desire you want this, with zeal, what vindication. In all things you prove yourself clear in the matter. You keep your conscience clear before God and men. That's our last step. So Mitch, I promise, last time you have to come up here. So Mitch, come on up. Yes, last time. Last time, we're going to go back to Pete. Pete definitely has got some confessing to do, I'll tell you that. Uh, we'll open the door to some relationships here. And uh, Pete, here's what you do. I did it. And you can, I was wrong, I'm sorry, will you forgive me for being, in this case, for being a cheater? He yeah. has a newspaper. He does have a newspaper. <laughs> you might want to start off with, I want one too. Will you forgive me <laughs> now, not later? You might want to add that part. So, all right. I did it. I hit you with the newspaper. I took off my blindfold. I was wrong, although Chad told me to do it. <laughs> hey, I'll confess my stuff. Don't be, man, see that justification? I know. Oh, all right. So did that feel good when he blamed me? Oh, yeah, it felt really good. Did it feel good when he blamed me? Oh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, all right, all right. Man, I think you just transferred the blame. All right, last part, will you forgive me? If not now, then. Forgive me if not now. When you can. Eventually. I forgive you. I forgive you. (laughs) Come here, Steve. Come here. I forgive you. Oh, man. Oh. Uh, We'll talk after, after service. All right, you guys can grab a seat. All right, so one more time, practice with somebody, turn to the person next to you, and try all those phrases. I I did it, I was wrong, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Okay, flip and reciprocate if you haven't yet. Ten seconds. All right, time is up. I had a guy I went to lunch with this week. He said uh, a kid in his neighborhood, eight-year-old kid, did something, whatever egregious is for an eight-year-old, but it was pretty serious. And he did it against his daughter. And they got the other family involved and the dad. And the dad was actually appreciative of how gracious he was being considering what the situation was. I don't actually know what it was. So he's walking his son over to apologize. And he's walking his son over to apologize. They come to the door. And this father, tell me the story, said, he says, now listen, before you apologize, I want to explain to you what we expect in an apology. He said, if you're going to apologize to my daughter, we expect you to say I was wrong. Tell us what it is. Say I'm sorry. Look person in the eye and say, will you forgive me? And I love that, just a real simple teaching. 
We, this does not come naturally. The reason we're practicing is it doesn't come naturally. We've got to learn the skill. We've got to model the skill. For many of us, we'll tell our kids, you better feel sorry. Let me tell you what doesn't work. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm sorry I got caught. No, see, that's not it. Sorry if I did anything. That's generic, doesn't work. It's a defense mechanism. Talking to the cupboards. See, you look at somebody, when you're young, you're so selfish. Then you apologize. I'm sorry if I did anything. And we're staring at the ceiling for some reason. We look people in the eye. I'm sorry. Oh, here's another one. It's not it. I'd like to apologize. Well, good. Why don't you start? (laughs) I'd like to apologize. It's not an apology. I am sorry. I did it. I am wrong. Will you forgive me? If not, now when you can. This is a four-step apology that we've modeled. I'm telling you, if you will do this, and I know most of us have not had this model to talk to us. If you'll do this, it will change your marriage. It will change your company. Get together with division and say, let's commit to each other that when we bruise each other, we'll come to each other and we'll acknowledge we'll take 100% responsibility for whatever 2 to 20 to 80% of the problem we caused. It will heal. It will destroy gossip. It will bring restoration. It will gain. You will not lose credibility as a leader. You will gain credibility as a leader. Because let me tell you, everyone in your organization knows that you have faults. Except maybe you. So if you start to acknowledge it, you gain credibility. You gain respect. You gain influence. So here's my challenge to us as we practice the habit of restarting or confession. This week, I'd like you to model at least a three-step apology. With somebody you know you've hurt. If you're not ready for that, do it with God. God, I was wrong when I did that. I am sorry that it put you on the cross. You had to die for that. Will you forgive me? Or if you're a follower of Christ, you can say, thank you that you've already forgiven me. That's a three-step apology. Apologize to your kids. You know, my kids are disrespectful. You know what piece of the puzzle I see? The piece of the trivial pursuit? You are so disrespectful to me. Don't you talk to your dad that way. What if instead I start with, listen, I want to talk about your disrespect in a moment, but can I just start by saying, I am sorry for how harsh I was and how I handled this. Now, wouldn't that change the dynamic of your conversation with your kids if you started by owning the piece of the puzzle that you're responsible for? Then, yes, let's talk about disrespect. Let's talk about, well, what about we own our impatience and our rudeness and our kindness? What if we model to our kids and they start going, oh, that's what it looks like? Well, let's just go, do you remember the last time your dad apologized to you? <laughs> really? Do you remember the last time your mom apologized? No. When we model this, it's attractive. We show our kids it works. Now, if you're ready for the double diamond, you can do a five-step apology this week. Now, if you go through our habits guide we passed out several weeks ago, there's more in the foyer. It'll walk you through habits all week long. A five-step is, I did it. I was wrong. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? If not, now then when? And will you hold me accountable? Will you mention this if you see it again? Well, I don't want to say that. That's what repentance is. I want to change. I want to humbly say, if you see this tendency in me, bring it to my attention. It's powerful. I want to invite the band to come up. I want to tell you a great quote I heard from Tony Dungy. Tony Dungy said that champions don't do extraordinary things. It's a weird thing for a coach to say. They do ordinary things, but they do it without thinking. Too fast for the other team to react. They follow the habits they've learned. You want to know how to restore your relationship with a prodigal son or daughter? You want to know how to restore your marriage or eliminate gossip from your, from your workplace? You don't have to do anything extraordinary. Start doing this ordinary thing well. Get faster at it without thinking. You, you, you don't go to defensiveness. You go to confession. Without going to justifying, you go to owning. Do ordinary things, and those deposits will empty out the gap in your life and bring, bring freedom. They will be the door that opens your heart to restoration. And if you are not ready to do that with somebody else, at least this week, do it with God. Practice that, and you're going to find that confession, that healing, that forgiveness washes over you in a fresh way. But in your program today, you'll see we gave everybody a post-it note. So if you want to have that post-it note open, I'm going to have the band play a little bit of this song. And I want you to be thinking about what is one thing, don't write anything down yet, what is one thing you might want to confess or one area you might want to open the door of your life as well. Let's listen to the band. Now, if you didn't see when we opened this thing up, we painted that middle section to have a cross to remember that God forgives us. He waits us. He can't wait for us to acknowledge what we've done wrong, not so he can throw us under the blanket of guilt, so he can say, you're free. You're free. I want to be back in a relationship with you and teach you how to do that as well. 
So I want to give you a chance to pray and respond to God, to thank God for this wall of, of agreement, this wall of freedom represented here today. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for giving us the tools to fix things when we mess up. Maybe if coming down seemed a little weird for you, you want to just tell God right now, God, I need help confessing. You know, say, God, I need courage to go talk to someone after service today. Maybe I want to ask God to bring someone to mind. God, bring to mind somebody that I need to restore a relationship with. God, we thank you on our pathway to Easter that you didn't watch from a distance. You came to dwell among us to model confession, to show us you were willing at great cost to yourself to die so that we could be free, that we would die to self, that we would die to self-centeredness, that we would die to pride so that we can restore relationships and move toward healthier ones with those around us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, man, you know, if you're interested more about the cross, we've got a special activity uh, that starts today from 12 to 20 to 1. We are going to have stations of the cross set up all around the church. If you want to walk through the stations of the cross, there'll be volunteers to help you across from our fireplace down the student theater, which why it doesn't start till 1210. So if you want to go grab brunch and come back, there'll be volunteers to walk you through the stations of the cross from 1210 to 1 today. Or if you want to come anytime tomorrow, it's an open house from 9 to 4 to walk through the stations of the cross and find out how powerful this message is as we head toward Easter. If you haven't got Easter tickets yet, we invite you to be there, invite your friends, tickets available, including that brunch. You can stop by the fireplace as well. Thanks for being here. If you came prepared to give us some offering boxes, we'll see you next week as we conclude with Habits, Part 7. Thanks again.